Uh, Scott, thank you for that very, very generous um, introduction. Um, as Scott said, we're going to be moving from personal focus on, on who we are as individuals into the public arena of Harvard. We're moving from, from I to we, in effect. Um, and we are going to be staying in the context of stories and narratives. So I want to begin uh, by reading from one of my favorite books, which is, you can see, it's really a favorite book. <laughs> it's Fallen Apart. It's After Virtue by Alasdair McIntyre. Some of you may have uh, encountered McIntyre in political philosophy. He's actually a, uh, a, a profoundly uh, committed Catholic uh, who writes on, on issues that are germane to us. Um, and I want to just read one sentence from McIntyre, which I think uh, can be helpful. A central thesis begins to emerge. Man is in his actions and practice essentially a storytelling animal. He is not essentially, but becomes through his history, a teller of stories that aspire to truth. I can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself a part? And that, let me read that line again, because that's what I want to emphasize here. Of what story or stories do I find myself a part? I think one of the major shifts from, let's say, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, even 20 years ago to the present is that we live in a universe that is much more one of collective stories of which each one of us is a part. In other words, we live in a universe which is much, much more diverse than it ever has been, and therefore the demand to appreciate interdependence is much, much greater. So that's, I want to unpack that a little bit and some of the challenges that we have if we're going to be sharing our stories with one another and focusing on what brings us together and actually what are differences in some of the challenges we face. When I was in college, came from the Midwest, St. Louis, Missouri, Connecticut, went to school in Connecticut, and grew up in a neighborhood that was Jewish and Catholic with a few Protestants. The Catholics I did not encounter in school because they went to Catholic schools. So fundamentally, the school I went to was primarily Jewish with a few Protestants. So I grew up basically in a very homogenized universe for the most part. Went to school in Connecticut and was shocked, really shocked, that I moved from one homogenous universe actually to another, but guess what? It wasn't the homogenous universe from which I came. Uh, all of a sudden, and this is literally first day of school, I'm looking up, everyone's 6'3", <laughs> everyone's blonde. Uh, I'm a little Jewish kid from St. Louis. Uh, very friendly. Guy extends his hand downward and says, hello, <laughs> I'm Oliver W. Hickel III. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't even know what that was, <laughs> Oliver W. Hickel III. And that really was the universe uh, that I was in. Uh, literally 65% of uh, the entering class uh, was from a New England prep school. Uh, the other ones were basically uh, not from prep schools, but all WASPy. There were um, quotas, which I, I, I only discovered after being there, didn't know any of this stuff. Quotas, uh, Catholics. Yes, every class we have 9% Catholics, every single class. Not, not one more, not one less. Uh, blacks, oh yeah, there are five blacks who had gone to prep schools or Quaker schools in Philadelphia. That was it. Uh, Jews, quota. Uh, every single Jewish freshman was placed with a Jewish roommate. Uh, again, none of this was announced, just look. So that's the universe that, uh, that I entered when I came to college. There wasn't a single Buddhist that I met, there wasn't a single uh, Muslim that I met, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously now we look around and we, we were blessed with another universe, which is one of extraordinary diversity, not just here at Harvard, but in the country. And that's the major shift. We, we live in a truly multicultural, diverse universe. The question is, what are some of the challenges 
that that puts before us. Because if we're going to enter into exploring the possibilities of diversity, we really have to fully appreciate what some of the, the challenges are that, 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 that face us. And so basically what I want to do here, and I'll do it fairly quickly, is just sort of list what I consider to be some of the challenges. Obviously, this is, isn't going to be exhaustive, and there's no way that we'll even begin to, I'm not going to delve into any of this. It's going to be more of a listing. The first is to make a, distinguish, a, a distinction between diversity and pluralism. Diversity is a fact. We don't have to dwell on it. I've already underlined. It's a fact. It's a fact of life. It's not the same as pluralism. Pluralism is a response to that fact. How do we respond to the fact of diversity? How do we do that? What are our strategies? Uh, this is a country that has been pluralistic in theory, but in reality it's been culturally a Christian country. And the pluralism of this country has basically been the pluralism of, more or less, the pluralism of different Christian faiths who will tolerate and allow other faiths to participate in the public square, but that's a far cry from what does it mean to engage difference? And so that's my second point. Pluralism is not about tolerating differences, it's about engaging differences. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges of that. Uh, what does it mean to actually see diversity as an opportunity for growth and not just something that is part of a political culture that is about fairness and justice, but is it necessarily about spiritual growth? Diversity as an opportunity for spiritual growth. So engagement with difference, that's a challenge. Why is that a challenge? Because difference is threatening, because all of us, you know, in our lives, I don't know whether we're wired for this, it's just the human condition, human beings seem to, in, in a sense, want to avoid tension. And engaging in difference is, requires a tolerance for tension. The tension of being with people and engaged in conversations that actually challenge your comfort level. So it means moving out of your comfort zone. And what are some of the challenges that come up there? Well, one of them, and these are examples of sort of cultural orientations, one could call them biases, that we all face when we're engaging in the public arena, certainly of the academy, but also outside of the academy. One is the orientation that basically equates pluralism with relativism. As a committed person of faith, relativism is threatening to me. Personally, I reject it outright. So if I am to engage in a pluralistic engagement with others, does that then mean that I'm engaged in a universe that underlines a philosophy of life that I reject, relativism? And the answer is no. Pluralism is not relativism. <laughs> But that is something that each person who's got a specific faith commitment has got to somehow deal with, that I am dealing with values, worldviews, uh, symbol systems that are other than me and have in some fundamental way legitimacy. How do I deal with my attitude towards truth? What does my faith say is its claim of truth on me if I'm engaging in the truth claims of other systems. So those are very, very uh, serious challenges. Another challenge is that's outside of relativism is reductionism. And this to me is one that I've actually uh, found to be personally one of the most offensive. And that is basically the assumption that, and this, this, this has to do uh, quite often with the, the interchange not between people of different faiths, but for me personally it's more when I'm dealing with a, uh, a traditional faith system and a secular faith system. And that is the assumption that is very dominant in this culture, um, that religion is, has some function other than what it's, it, it claims to be. 
And so, you know, all the various intellectual versions of that, Freud, future of an illusion, Marx, the open, all these, these assumptions that w if you are a religious person, yes, I can explain it in terms other than its content. And so the challenge of reductionism is to move into the actual content of what different religions and faiths claim they are and not be afraid to engage in content. In fact, to insist upon the importance of engaging in content. Another one is the tension between particularism and universalism. And this is something that, uh, you know, again, is a challenge because tension is a problem for us. And the particularistic person that I am as an individual and the particularism of my Jewish faith and the universalism of my Jewish faith is a tension. And in my faith, tensions actually, Jews are, if you haven't noticed it, we're tense people. <laughs> we're out looking for people. You know, we, we are very tense people. We're dialectic. Uh, but that's not necessarily something that is, um, you know, intuitively good. We, so we, we sort of, we revel in tension. But tension is, is, you know, frankly, a difficult thing. And the tension between the particular faith claims and the, impl and the universal implications of it uh, basically push us quite often into one pole or the other. The over-insistence on my uniqueness, the uniqueness of my faith, which of course pushes us into superiority issues. No one is like us, we're this, we're, we're great, you're, well, don't quite have that. That's the radicalism, that's radical particularism. Or the opposite where basically I believe what you believe, we all believe the same thing. So how to negotiate particularism and universalism. Um, and finally, uh, just for the sake of this framing, not, I'm not, certainly not exhausting the challenges, um, I would say is the importance of insisting that interfaith dialogue, which includes dialogue between the secular world and the world of the faith community, basically means that you're engaging whole people in discussions. We're not, in other words, only dealing with opinions, views, ideas, that the faith content that anyone holds in some way is not just an idea that's compelling, it's something that informs one's whole life. And that, that goes for the faith of a humanist, the faith of a Jew, the faith of a Buddhist, etc. These are ideas that are lived that matter to our identities in very deep ways. And so when you're talking with people about what matters to them, it's not simply abstract beliefs and ideas and values, it's something that has to do with their very being and that changes the nature of the discussion. So uh, let's keep some of these ideas in mind. Other, other ideas and challenges uh, will come up inevitably in the course of our discussions. Let's, let's go back to our small groups. Um, we will, as, as, as uh, Scott mentioned, we will be moving more into um, the content of the, how the I basically can engage others in the public space of Harvard, and what kind of academy, what kind of campus do, do we want to see in the future as we move forward that can facilitate interfaith, not just discussion, but a shared life of people of faith on an, in an academy that's very complex and very rich.